along the way, I sort of made a conscious decision to say, I want a third invested in my business. I want a third in the market. And I want a third in real estate. And we were pretty good on that for a while. When I look at money, my whole target is to grow net worth. And so if money comes in, you want to keep as much as possible, which means buying assets, not having expenses. And so that's a basic, for an accountant, that's a basic thought. But for the average person, it's not necessarily basic. You're listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast, where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their current portfolio allocation. Now to your hosts, Clark Sheffield and Jace Mattinson. Welcome back. Another episode of the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast. This is Clark. I'm here with Jace. This is episode 241. Jace, what's going on? Hey, man. Just uh, rocking into the summer here. How are you doing? I'm doing well. We got a question from a listener from Daniel. He says, as an aspiring millionaire, the slog of grinding can be discouraging at times. As an investor primarily using 401k, IRAs, HSA, 529, so primarily in the market here, and brokerage accounts, how do you remain focused on building wealth in the years, five to 10 years before the sharp uptick of compound interest gets exciting? So until you basically have a nest egg where you feel like you're making progress, you know, how do you stay focused? And then he says, at what point do you decide to ease up on saving, on the saving mentality and shift the focus until saving and enjoying? What are some reasonable milestones to stop and breathe? So what, what what do you think, Jace? At what point do you, I get, I mean, I think what he's really asking here is when do you take your foot off the gas or how far do you go until you can sit back and maybe feel like you have that critical mass starting to work for you? Yeah, this is, I think this is a f- phenomenal question and something that I've contemplated a lot over the last couple of years and something I've discussed with my wife a lot because as as many people know on our episode, we had a, we had a couple which was, I guess, I don't know, about a year or two ago now. We had a, a couple of funny things, you know, in terms of what we were doing in our 20s versus in our 30s. There was a book, and we've referred to it a couple of times on here, that Bill Perkins wrote called Die With Zero that really changed my personal mindset and framework around, you know, celebrating slash taking the foot off the gas and just kind of t- changing my approach overall in general to, one, just making sure that I don't miss out on certain experiences that can only be had at, at certain ages and stages of life. And so I've been more intentional in trying to make those happen regardless of how much money it costs. And I, and I always think back to something that I missed out on in my early 20s. I had the money. It wasn't going to go into debt. Uh, and that was returning to Bulgaria where I'd gone on a church service mission and spent some time with some people that I had, what, that I knew that were going back. And I didn't go because I was worried about having enough money to save for college and pay for different things. And I still remember this day. I had $13,000 in my bank account at that point and no debt trip would have cost maybe two grand and I didn't take it and I've always regretted it. So those are the kinds of things personally where you know, making sure along the journey that you don't miss out on, on those experiences because you're trying to, to build wealth, but also, you know, no one else is going to celebrate you except for you. So make sure that you, you know, you go out to those dinners or you go have those celebratory moments uh, for those milestones. And those milestones are going to be different depending on what your goals are. Yeah. But when, I mean, when do you go feel like, you and I, right? You talk about buying new golf clubs, right? For a thousand dollars, or maybe it's a car. At what point? In my mind, and I think we're both kind of around the same place. But correct me if I'm wrong. I think if you're, you know, Daniel here is talking about investing in the markets. I think a good critical mass. Once you start doing time value money calculations, and you have two, three hundred thousand dollars in retirement accounts or in the market, and you're, I, mean, I don't know how old he is. He doesn't say here, but. If you're 30 years old with a few hundred thousand dollars, I mean, you're going to grow significant, right, over the next 25, 30 years. But for me personally, I think it was when you get to four or five hundred thousand dollars and you feel like you kind of have some mass, that's when you start to notice that your money's working for you. Admittedly, I think I was probably too much the other way in sense of go, 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 go and not spend and not spend. But um, my wife and I have spent on travel and, and we've been happy to do it because it's experiences that we look back on and don't regret spending the money. You know, we're happy. 
that we did that and it's things we don't want to forget. So I think it's a balance for everybody. I think you need to celebrate along the way, but I, I think also you need to understand that if you, if you want to hit it a certain amount or have passive income or a certain net worth or whatever the financial goal is, you got to work harder at first. And I think that means saying no, unless you have just unbelievable income where you can keep doing that. Yeah, no. I think it's a fair question. It, it totally is. And we always hear it from so many of our guests that they wish they would have started earlier. So I think the other part of that is make, making sure that if you didn't start early, that you have enough time and have enough effort to catch up. Right. Right. And, and yeah, having 300 in the bank at 50 isn't quite the same as having 300 in the bank at 30, right? Where you have another 30 years where it's working for you until you need to pull it out. So I think, Daniel, I don't know how old you are, but I think that kind of depends a lot on age and maybe how much you have, right? If you have 50 or 100, you probably need to stay, keep the foot on the gas a little bit, even if you're young. If you're sitting at 500 and you're young, you're probably okay to start letting it off. If you're sitting at over a million and you're mid, you're, you're okay. So, you know, I think realizing too what your goal is, right, Chase? We've talked about passive income and finding how much maybe you want to spend in, in the future in retirement and trying to make that best estimate. I mean, just getting clarity off that and then you get to a certain point and you feel like, hey, even if I don't touch anything or even if I just contribute to an IRA going forward, I'm going to be pretty good. Yep. So anyway, thanks for writing in, Daniel. If you have a question, email us millionairesunveiled at gmail.com. We'll talk about it on the show or ask one of the millionaires we interview. Also, you could go to our website, millionairesunveiled.com, hit the tab, ask a millionaire and either record uh, something. We'll play it on the show if it's, if it's a question or, or we'll, we'll ask some of our millionaires as well. So thanks again to, to Daniel last week. Just as a quick recap. We had Daniel, an American citizen that lives in Japan, works as a professor, net worth of just over a million, 1.2, mostly in real estate that he owns in the U.S., which is split between his real estate that he personally owns, some syndications, and then also some private money lending. Uh, he discussed, pretty interesting, it's not a discussion we've had on the show previously, but some of the financial challenges that arise from investing in the U.S. while living abroad, and also the difference in mindsets that he's noticed between those he associates with in the U.S. and those uh, who he's associated with Japan, I believe, for the last 10 or 12 years or so. So a little bit more of a different mindset of investing. So thanks to Daniel for coming on this week. We have Adam, net worth of 4.3, former accountant turned financial advisor and business owner. And his 4.3 is split between business, the market, and real estate. So kind of that three-legged stool approach. So Excited for his episode, and without any further delay, let's get right into it. Adam, do you want to just give us a little bit about your background and what you're up to now? Sure. I am an investment advisor that deals with money every day, and I've owned my own advisory business for nearly 20 years, and I currently split time between Arizona and the Pacific Northwest and get the best of both seasons. Married, been married for 20 years this year, have two children. And they go to public school uh, just down the street from our house. And just a year ago, we took a nine-month hiatus sabbatical uh, in an RV, a truck and a 30-foot trailer. And went. we tried to hit 48 states in 52 weeks, but COVID derailed us. So that's me. Awesome. I don't want to get into a bunch of this, but before we do, what is your net worth today? Uh, we are at 4.3. And what is the makeup of the 4.3? So about a million is what my business is worth. And then I have retirement accounts that are another million. And then um, I actually have a sports card collection that's worth probably 50000 Um have my dad's old Pete Rose rookie and some other really highly valued um, cards. And then uh, we have a bunch of real estate. So I we were at 17 units, my wife and I. But we've sort of scaled that back and we're continuing to scale back. Prices are really high and it's a good time to sell. So I, I suppose it'd be about $2 million in real estate, maybe a little more. And so you say 17 units or you had that scaling back. Is that all single family homes or is there some duplexes or multifamily in there? We did have an eightplex and um, funny situation. My friend was in a 1031 exchange and he was getting down to the wire and he said, I can't find anything attractive. And I said, well, if you get desperate, you should go take a look at my Aplex and let me know if you want it and we'll make a deal. And he ended up saying, I need it. I want it. Let me have it. <laughs> so there we were. Interesting. So how long have you accumulated all those 
uh, properties and units over the years? So our first investment property we purchased in 2011 or 12, and it was a foreclosure, uh, a house that I was actually off knowledge by the owner and uh, declined it then for I think it was I think he wanted 110,000, and I ended up picking it up out of foreclosure for 60,000. Um, not from him. He had sold it to someone else. But yeah, so that got us on the start. We fixed it up. We rented it for a couple of years and then we sold it again to a friend who was desperate to find a place. Young family, just got married, needed a nice three bedroom, two bath with a fenced backyard and he wanted it. Interesting. So uh, we want to get a little more into the, the real estate is since a half a, you know, roughly half your portfolio. But before we do the the amount you have in retirement accounts, is that how is that divided up between tax advantaged and or is it, or at least in your mind, do you set aside that way in Roth traditional or is some of that in taxable, but yes. you've got set aside that way for retirement or how is that kind of broken up in your mind? Yeah. So we, in Roth, we probably have about combined about a quarter million in Roth assets. And then the other, th- most of the three quarter million is in tax sheltered, tax deferred, 401k and Probably a hundred thousand outside of of tax shelters that's in the markets. Interesting. And then you mentioned your business. So you've got these three big buckets, if you want to call them that. Was that by design? It was a, a few years ago when we started to really increase our net worth. So ten years. It's taken us ten years. The last ten years, we've we've really grown since our second daughter was born. We've grown our net worth tremendously from a quarter of a million to four point three million. And it, along the way, I sort of made a conscious decision to say, I want a third invested in my business. I want a third in the market, and I want a third in real estate. And we were pretty good on that for a while. I have invested more heavily in my business recently to try to catch it up. And so the value is down a bit because I've, I brought on two new employees in the last, uh, one each of the last two years. And so I'm investing heavily there. We're growing like crazy. And so it's been, it's, tr- it's tried to be conscious, but a third, a third, a third was the plan. And, and when did you come up with that a third, a third and a third model? Um, I think it may have been, Around the time where we were starting to get into the two million range, and I thought, okay, we're getting really heavily invested in the market, and so let's start accumulating some real estate. And so in 2015, we really started because we were light in that category, and so we were gobbling up real estate at pretty reasonable prices. We we did 2012, 2013, 2014, but uh, a lot happened. Uh, in 2015, 2016. And so, yeah, we've got, I, I can't even keep track of the units, but I think we're at like eight or nine units left. And I'm, I'm probably going to get rid of two this year. Okay. So the, you mentioned the sports cards and it's, it's interesting, especially with the rise of Top Shot recently. Why did you start kind of collecting the sports cards and did you do that with the intent that at some point they would have enough value that maybe you would sell them and 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 couple that with have you gotten involved in looking at top shot or doing some of these digital ones yeah it's an interesting story um i collected as a kid i started collecting when i was eight or nine i got a box of cards for my birthday or christmas and in 1986 and off i went and i got a price guide and i started looking stuff up and i was trading with friends um, and I was a big sports fan as a kid, watched a lot of basketball, watched a lot of football and baseball. And so I had this collection from when I was a kid, and I've sort of sold it off along the way, some of the things that I didn't really care about, because, boy, the card market went, really went bad after the late 80s, early 90s. And it started to come back recently, um, really during the pandemic, in terms of value and interest. And I got back into it. I actually had a friend who suggested back in 2019 that because of able income and growing our net worths, and we were going to have that midlife nostalgia. And he said, I'm going to collect all the Michael Jordan rookie cards I can. And he got four PSA 10s for, you know, combined price of less than $50,000. And one now goes for almost three quarters of a million uh, in two years. I mean, it's been an incredible turn. Um, so there's been some interest and people say, okay, how can we digitize something like that as a collectible? And so these non-fungible tokens of NBA Top Shot, um, video clips, it doesn't make sense to me. But of course, 
cardboard doesn't make sense to my wife. So <laughs> it's just a perspective thing. <laughs> so he, so let me just, uh, that's pretty crazy. So he bought those cards for, you said three for 50. So whatever, 17 K each. And now they go for three thirty three each. Uh, no, they go for over 700. I mean, I think there one went the other day for 492, $492,000 for one card, Michael wow. Jordan PSA 10. So that created a ton of interest. I mean, just watching the exponential growth of that got me going again. And so I decided I'm going to re- kickstart my collection again. And there's a second reason behind it, because they're printing money like mad. I mean, we have right. trillions and trillions being helicoptered, and the Fed is printing $130 billion a month to buy bonds. Cash is a bad place to be right now. So I thought, well, where can I get some other exposure that's not real estate, that's not stocks, that's not bonds, that's not cash? And sports cards are of interest to me. So what's your take on that? Because it seems like most asset classes are highly priced right now. Some may be even inflated. Do do you think sports cards in 10 years are worth more than they are today? I do. I do. I think there there was a major inflation in January, February, March this year in sports cards. And we've taken a step back from that. Just the Jordan as an example. It went for 748 and then 492 two months later. And so that's a, you know, a 33% drop in two months. And I think that's sort of like what happens in other markets. There's a big hype, there's a big push, and then people say, whoa, what am I spending three quarters of a million on a piece of cardboard for? Come to find out, it was celebrities that were outdoing each other saying, I paid more than you for my Jordan kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a pride thing because guess what? Helicopters of money are being flown and uh, people don't know what to do with it. So did your friend sell the Jordan cards or is he holding on? He still has four and he just sent one to Golden Auctions, who is the big one that got those big dollars and they have all the celebrity clients. And so he sent one in and it's going to come up in one of the auctions in the next few weeks. Wow. Wow. Pretty amazing. And what's your your Pete Rose rookie is your highest price card? Yeah, I, well, it's currently at PSA getting graded, uh, and they're they're backlogged like three years, so it's pretty pretty bad. But I have a Larry Bird Magic Johnson rookie card, and that one is m- my favorite because those are those are from my childhood, and it's worth probably between five and seven thousand. That's probably my best card. Wow, amazing! That's five to seven in Jordans, <laughs> five to seven hundred, right? <laughs> yes, yes. See. It's a value, and so it's a good one to hold. Interesting. Yeah, it's just it, it, the craziest of asset classes have started going up and coming back. I mean, Jason and I joked a few weeks ago on our introduction that like Beanie Babies and everything else was going to come back because people were just buying things and, you know, GameStop, game cards, everything Spacks, just seems to be going. Bitcoin, yeah, yeah, exactly. Garbage Pail Kids. Yeah. So let's go back in your your history a little bit here, Adam. You're an investment advisor now. What did you do before that? Let's get into your story here. Sure. I started out at a software company, but I'm not a tech guy. I'm more of an accountant. And so I was, it was an accounting software firm. And so I worked there for about 18 months, decided I didn't want to climb the corporate ladder. It was a large organization, publicly traded. And so I left them to become an actual accountant and worked with a very small company where basically I did all the work. I was the accountant and controller and uh, the owners made all the money. And I became a little envious because I saw the checks I was cutting them. And then, of course, I saw my own payroll check and decided I wanted to be like them. And the reality is, and and they told me, they said, we're going to give you an MBA just from being here. I only have a bachelor's degree. And they said, you're going to get to touch all the dials and we're going to teach you business. And it was incredible. They did just that. But what they taught me is that I want to be an owner of a small operating company. And that was the way to wealth that, that they showed me. And I believed it. And so I said, well, I'm going to start my own company. I'm happy to continue managing money for you guys, but I'm going to also open up to other clients. And that's where I started my venture. Awesome. And then you've continued to grow it today. Yeah, we're growing. I mean, we're growing double digits pretty much every year uh, since I started in 2002. Awesome. And what's your... what? So you talk about the three-bucket approach you mentioned, Jay, small business markets and real estate. Is that what you advise clients to do as well? 
I do if they have the aptitude and the capacity to own a business. Owning a business gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of how to save and invest because a lot of people don't have access to retirement accounts. A lot of people, they don't have tax advantages. And so both real estate and a small business give you some exposure to those items. And as a planner, I see these opportunities and I try to share them with people and say, hey, you know, they're frustrated because they pay a ton in tax. I say, well, or and maybe their wife doesn't work. Well, what if your wife started her own business and you both started saving for retirement there and, you know, you'll have some tax write-offs. You know, there are things you can write off when you own a company or similarly when you own real estate. I tease that I tell my clients like Las Vegas or Arizona because you can travel down there to check on it and, you know, your travel is uh, potentially a write-off. Yeah, totally. Am I going to ask, I mean, as you've been working with, with all these clients and, and working, you know, in this space and working with money, what are maybe the, some of the most common questions or common problems and mistakes that come up over your 20-year career? I think just people having the financial literacy to know, if I want to save and invest, where should I start? I had a, a young guy text me the other day and he said, should I do a Roth or should I do index funds? <laughs> and I said, yes, <laughs> you should do both. And you should do index <laughs> funds inside your Roth. He goes, what? I thought they were different. I mean, this is the, and he's a, you know, a college graduate and a Roth is the umbrella. It's the type of account. It gives you a tax shelter. And then what you invest in inside there is, you know, whatever you want. It could be bank CDs. But um, so the difference between just having that financial literacy to say, he, he, he was ready. I want to start saving and investing. Should I do a Roth or should I do index funds? Because he's heard both of those, you know, bantered about. And of course, he should do both. <laughs> do index funds inside his Roth. And he said, okay, I just went to Vanguard and I opened up a Roth. I said, perfect. You're off and running. Um, the other the other one that I was going to mention was a lot of times, especially real estate investors, they focus on cash flow. And so they want to know, what's my cash flow? What's my cash flow? And back in the heyday of real estate, they were actually doing negative amortization loans to get better cash flow, which looked really good until values dropped and places foreclosed because the loan was far more, far, you know, more than what the value was. And so cash flow is good. There's nothing wrong with positive cash flow. But when I look at money, my whole target is to grow net worth. And so if money comes in, you want to keep as much as possible, which means buying assets, not having expenses. And so that's a basic for an accountant. That's a basic thought. But for the average person, it's not necessarily basic. Totally. So to that a notion of, of buying assets and acquiring assets. At some point, those assets get converted into cash flow that you live off of, right? You know, whether it's retirement accounts or, you know, paid for real estate that creates that income stream. Is it good for people to ever flip that switch or it, should they really, in your opinion, always just be focusing on accumulating more assets? Well, at some point, you flip the switch and you have enough assets to provide the cash flow that you need for the rest of your life. And for the typical person, that's when they become eligible for Social Security because that's a big cash flow spigot for most Americans. You know, you become eligible at 62, but benefits max out at 70. And so any time in that range is typically when people flip the switch. The FIRE community says we're not dependent on any date for Social Security or Medicare or anything. We're going to accumulate enough assets that we can live on just the income from those assets at some point. And sometimes it's, I just had one we did a plan for. She's 43 and she's done at the end of this year. She will not have to work again. I mean, she has just saved and rattled and, you know, invested aggressively in low cost index funds and done tremendously. So in that case, or just in general, in those cases where people are, you know, achieving that financial independence or you know, the fire community at an age you know, much before what has been the traditional norm, what kind of incomes or, or, or lifestyle are they living on? I mean, we're talking 70 grand, 80 grand, 120 grand, kind of what's the range there for, for a majority of them? 
Well, there's a there is quite a range. So I, I don't know if you follow Mr. Money Mustache or some of those others, but there's a guy I think that lives off fifteen thousand dollars a year, and that he has enough assets to provide that, which it doesn't take very much. I mean, it take you know a quarter million dollars or something, and you could probably do it. Um, and that's what he lives on. But then, so that's lean fire, and then there's fat fire, and those people are generating six figures, uh, typically six figures per member of the household. Uh, and that's fat fire. So you're, you're living large. And the rule in fire is 4%. So if you have a million dollars, you can generate $40,000 of income. And the question is, would you be happy not going to work tomorrow if you could make 40000 a year from your assets? For most people, that's not enough. That's why they have to wait for Social Security to kick in. And now they're making 70000 a year. Now it's more comfortable. But for... I am a member of the fire community. However, I was doing fire before fire was real. Like it wasn't even a thing. Um, but I really latched on when I found out about it. I was just about to ask. So, are, what what's what's your plan going forward? Yeah. So it's in the air. I mean, I sort of said as soon as my kids graduate and they move out of the house, that is going to give us some measure of freedom, and we want to be able to travel to where they are and where they land. And so my work, what I say is in 10 years, my work will look different than it does today. So right now, I'm still working full time. I'm doing a lot. Uh, We're still growing like crazy. And I get to keep a majority of of the profit. But at some point, I'm going to bring in a partner, uh, find my successor, or join a larger firm so that a lot of the the major stuff is taken care of. So I have a 10-year runway for that. And then what my work life looks like is totally dependent on if I enjoy it and if I'm allowed to do what I like. So you mentioned Social Security. Do you think it's going to be around? Are you telling oh, your clients to plan on it? Yeah, it's going to be around. So right now, the calculations are that they have 77%. So if if uh, when the trust fund runs out, which is in 12 years or something, um, or maybe it's six years now, I don't remember, but when it runs out, the money coming in from from workers should cover 77% of the money going out. And so if nothing changes, your checks are getting cut by 23%. That's what I tell people. And so when we run financial plans, we actually do a stress test to say, what if Social Security is cut by 25%? Can you still survive? Because that's worst case. I think they'll fix it. (laughs) It's political suicide to touch it, though. So nobody's... Oh, I agree. I think they're going to fund it. (laughs) I, I mean, heck, we just printed a ton of money. Into debt. We can pr- yeah. print it for that if they we need to, right? <laughs> they, they're not allowed to without some congressional act. And so they just have to do it. Yeah, if they would allow them to print it to send out the checks, all is well. The dollars are worth less, but you still get the dollars. So when you started your business, Adam, I mean, was, was it a grind? Was it hard? How did you first land your clients? How did you build it out? How long did it tell it? to it take you until you felt like you were comfortable and getting somewhere with it? Ah, that's a great question. And it's a good story. So when my wife and I got married, she allowed me to quit my job and start from scratch because she was a teacher. She had a decent salary. She had good benefits for us. And so she said, go ahead, live your dream, start your business, which was, that was a blessing. It was the reason, you know, we've been so successful. It all starts from that little seed. And For five years, I kept telling her, when I get to five million under management, which would generate fifty thousand of revenue, we can start. We can have a baby. We can have a family. And so I worked for. uh, I think I hit in two thousand seven. And so I said, okay, we've hit the mark. Now we can start a family. And so we started our family. And um, from there, we just kept continuing to grow. And 2008, with the the downfall of the markets, we had a little dip, but that's been it. And we've had some tremendous growth every year, aside from 2008. And how I got clients was, I'm not a salesperson. I'm an accountant. I'm that nerdy guy with the visor and the glasses in the back. Um, And so other people shared my story for me. And it was totally a referral fire, which... The reason we're continuing to grow so rapidly is because it continues to burn 
and that fire goes out and people say, gosh, you should talk to this person. You should talk to that person. Can you help that person? They're selling a building. They don't know what to do with the money. And I said, whoa, don't sell the building without knowing what the taxes are going to be first. Let's talk 1031 exchange. You know, I also had side gigs. So when I started my business, I was a coach. So I made a couple thousand bucks a season coaching basketball and soccer. And then I taught at a couple of local colleges. I taught investments and accounting. So I always had a side gig to supplement what I was making from my really small business. And I didn't quit my side gigs until 2010. Yeah. So, I mean, I for eight years, I was growing a business and I was working side gigs. I mean, I even drove Uber. I drove Uber. I coached. I taught. I did earnings conference call editing and publishing of transcripts for a a, a Wall Street data company. I could sit at home (laughs) late at night, listen to the recordings of the the call. The transcribers had totally messed it up because they don't know accounting terms. They don't know what they're talking about. And so I had to edit it and get it ready to go out to Wall Street. Interesting. Interesting. And how much were you making when you quit those? How much much was it? did it take to say I'm done doing the side gigs? Um, well, they started changing. So they stopped using foreign transcribers and they started using voice to text. So it got even worse. (laughs) Um, and so I, I basically bailed on that gig, but I was making $75 (laughs) an hour from home when I was, you know, had downtime and it was, it was tremendous. I got, I got promoted from editor to publisher and like I was on the, on the move. Uh, It was a really neat system. And um, coaching, I just sort of fizzled on that. I had little kids and it's hard to be gone every night and to travel. And so, um, and there were some changes in the, in the department. And so I, I walked away from all that. How did you, um, how did you find the editing? Job? I think I, f- I found it on Craigslist as one of those gigs. And I thought, this is right up my alley. I listened to earnings conference calls already. And so what was fun was I got to pick <laughs> the companies. So they'd say, here's the list of all the companies tonight. As you log in, you get to grab the ones you wanted. And so I would grab companies I was interested in. And I got to know the CEOs just from listening to them every quarter. Um, The CEOs, the CFOs, and I got to listen about their business. I mean, it was a really, it was right up my alley. That's really interesting. It's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, gigs are becoming more and more of a thing. I feel like... 10, 20 years ago, you didn't hear about all the side gigs as much. And now, I mean, it's really the internet that's made it so much more available to everybody. That and, and I mean, your smartphone, your smartphone has made you valuable. I mean, you can drive for Uber. I, I just did Uber when I was going to the bank or going down to Home Depot. I would say, oh, I'll pick somebody up and take them somewhere on my way. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was something you, different. Did you ever have to go in the totally opposite direction? Yes. I picked someone up at my bank and I drove them all the way to the other side of town. And I was thinking, okay, I was going to go home after going to the bank, but now I'm going over here past the airport. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it was always good money. Those those long trips are good money. Yeah. So it was worth yeah. it. You know, you make 40 bucks to drive them around. No big deal. Yeah. We interviewed a guy, what, Jace, a couple months ago. We haven't launched the episode yet, but he said he would leave for work in the morning. He, he would, I, think I, I can't remember the state, but he would drive right by the airport to go to his work. And he said if he timed it right, he would pretty much always pick somebody up. That was, was in Phoenix. In Phoenix. Right yeah, on coming airport. from like the East Valley down into the, the Phoenix airport. So he's coming from the eastern side of the, the valley there. Yeah. I mean, it, it it's amazing. And, you know, to pick up 30 or 40 bucks on your way, I mean, there's your lunch and you can take a friend out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's go back. I know you mentioned a little bit with Jace here, real estate. Let's talk about how that got started and, and if you want to keep building it up or you're phasing it out, what's your plan with that? Yeah. So my wife stopped teaching when we t- took our RV trip two years ago. And I said, okay, when we get back, I would like you to take over property management because I was doing trying to manage the properties and manage my business. And I was overwhelmed um, and she was working full time. So I said, let's do this. Let's take a sabbatical and let's come back and you focus on the properties. I'll focus on my business. We'll be great. And that's been working out well. Uh, there are some reasons why we want to scale down. We have four Airbnb units and those are pretty intense with turnover, restocking, cleaning, um, making sure things are ready to go and 
repaired and fixed and and communicating with tenants. Nobody can figure out a lockbox. Nobody can find directions. You know, the, a lot of old people come down to Arizona in the winter and they don't really know how to use technology. So you're, you're often helping them. So the Airbnbs are pretty intense work for her. So we're going to scale back one of those units. And my idea is that we're going to 1031 exchange, but we're not going to 1031 exchange into another landlord heavy headache. We're going to 1031 exchange into a DST followed by a REIT. And I don't know if you or your listeners are familiar with IRS section 721 that says you can 1031 exchange into a REIT. And what's magic about it, and this is a big fire community thing, is let's say you have a quarter million dollars in cash that you're in equity that you're going to 1031 exchange. So you 1031 exchange it into a DST, which is a Delaware statutory trust, which is an allowable real estate trust that uh, exists for less than 10 years. You get rent checks, you don't have any headache. So those are, those are beautiful in a way. They're just very illiquid. Um, the beautiful thing about a REIT is that it's very liquid and you have lots of properties, lots of diversification. And so it's sort of a dream of mine and I've counseled clients to do this and I'm going to be the guinea pig that does the 1031 to a REIT. And so I, I want to do that this year with either one or two of our properties. Interesting. I don't think we've heard somebody doing that yet on our show, at least. And maybe I'm sure there's people that maybe have explored doing something similar because it is, we do have quite a few that come on with real estate, but I don't know of any that have gone into to a REIT. So after you do that, uh, I'm not as familiar with that section of the code. Can you take it out of that REIT and go back into real estate? You cannot. So the okay. REIT is the terminal place. So the beautiful thing about the REIT, so here's here are a couple of reasons why I then I'm young to do this. It's it's more meant for people that are in their seventies or eighties that have owned real estate for years and years and are done. But the beautiful thing is the heirs still get a step up in basis of the REIT shares. So let's say all the heirs inherit an apartment complex. And one of the heirs says, well, I want to I want to keep collecting the rent checks. And another one says, no, we should fix it up and sell it. And the other one says, I don't want to spend all that money. Let's just keep collecting the money from being a slumlord. Or I don't want to fix it up. Let's sell it as it is. Now you have this fight of all the heirs in this apartment building. What if they all inherited shares of a REIT with stepped up basis? They do whatever they want. <laughs> they take the money out. They do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. um, no question. They, they each get a third of the shares. So... That's one beautiful thing of it. The second beautiful thing is if you have taxable income less than $80,000 as a couple, you don't pay long-term capital gains tax. Well, guess what? What if I only sold 80,000 of REIT shares that gave me 80,000 of gains? I would pay zero capital gains tax on it. I can't sell only 80,000 of my apartment complex. <laughs> so you can chunk it out and provide yourself retirement income that's potentially tax-free. So that's what I like about it. And so I need to be the guinea pig because I've told lots of people, I've told you, I've told some clients, this is an awesome idea. And everybody looks at me skeptically. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to show them how it works. Yeah, totally. So your plan, at least with, with some of these properties, you're going to 1031 into those. And then you're essentially going to just hold it there forever until you want to take that 80K out. Right. Until is that correct? I, I have to craft my income. Yeah. yeah. Either that or I can... Donate it to the heirs because the REIT pays you rents. The REIT continues to pay rent. Yeah, yeah, totally. Interesting. So with the properties that you've had over the last several years here, have you self-managed all of them? I do have a property management team that I hire and they do a lot of the um, – like I'll give them half the first month's rent if they'll find me a good tenant mm -hmm. and then I can take over. Uh, sometimes they do the full management for me. They also market our Airbnb, one of our Airbnb properties for us um, and fill it up typically in the summer in Arizona, which is amazing. They're awesome to have. So I do have a professional property management team that I work with, but they're really good with me, very flexible with, do you want us to do this? Do you want us to take that over? Do you want us to do it month to month? Do you just want us to find you a tenant? And they're really nice to work with. And I can pick and choose for each property in each situation. Interesting. So as you've acquired these properties, you mentioned earlier that it's all about you know accumulating assets. When you were buying them, was looking at the cash flow or potential cash flow something that you have evaluated or, or you know took 
t- took a look at during the underwriting process? Is there more, can I buy this at a decent enough deal so that down the road, you know, it doubles and triples in value, you know, based on the, the, the appraised value or the, you know, what sell price or whatever? What was kind of your strategy there? So I actually ignore appreciation when I'm doing an analysis of real estate. I want to know what my rental return is. So if I'm putting 50000 down on something, I want a 5 or 6% rental return. And so I have to calculate what my cash flow is going to be and make sure that it's 5 or 6% on my cash. So if I'm investing 50000 I need to get you know, 3000 a year net cash flow. And, and it's not even net cash flow because I will give credit for the principal pay down of the note. And so I want a 6% return. So it's only the interest cost of the mortgage that I'm worried about. Because what else am I going to do with that $50,000? i am going to go invest it somewhere and I'm going to get some return on it. Well, some of my mortgage payment goes right into equity. So that's not an expense. That's an asset I'm buying with that piece. So that's when, when I talk about cash flow, it's not about cash flow. It's about rental return in my mind. And then the appreciation I consider as gravy. And I tell, I tell my clients to do the same thing. I said, don't think about appreciation because you don't know. You don't know if it's going to appreciate. You don't know if values are going down. You don't know if right. it's going to beat inflation. So just ignore it and just assume you're going to match inflation. Yeah, if that, even sometimes. <laughs> right. Depends on the market. I mean, if you want to be conservative. To yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, Adam, what's your thought on cash? Should people be holding cash at, right now? Should they, I mean, is there a max or a minimum people should hold when they get too much cash and they just put it in the market? I feel like it's kind of a tough thing to, to handle sometimes depending on where the stock market is too, especially now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stocks are, are richly valued. I mean, bonds are scary. Cash is a great short-term holding. Never be afraid to hold cash for three months, six months. Um, you know, if you don't know what you're going to do next, cash is fine, but cash is not an investment. And so it's really a holding place. It's just a bookmark. And you have to decide at some point what you're going to do with that cash. It might be buy a piece of real estate. It might be buy a business. It might be put it in the market. But today, cash is scary because the government is helicoptering it down to everyone. I mean, I just got an email this afternoon about the uh, economic injury disaster loan or emergency something disaster loan, the EIDL. Yeah, yeah, the EIDL. Yeah. They were they were capped at 150,000 last summer, and they just said, "Hey, everybody that took one of those, we're deferring payments for another year, so you don't have to start making payments this summer, and you can now borrow up to 500,000 with no real estate collateral." I mean, wow. this is coming from the Small Business Administration of the federal government, and they're just throwing money at businesses. And now pe- they're going to pay people that have kids, 300 a month per kid. And oh, another one, the um, health care premiums. So everybody who accepted a subsidy at the beginning of the year, typically you do your taxes and then you figure out, did you qualify for the full subsidy or do you have to pay some back? This year they said, don't worry, nobody has to pay it back. Regardless of how much, you could have made $500,000, you don't have to pay your health care subsidy back. And so more money in the system is scary to me. The cash is, we are awash in cash. And so sports cards are something that's different, that's not stocks, that's not cash, that's not bonds. So I thought, I'll put a little bit there. It's an interesting space. (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of like to throw it at it and see what happens. And most everything is going up right now. And and I think sports cards, I buy only vintage stuff, you know, stuff from my child at 20, 30, 40 years old. And that stuff, they're not making any more of it. And it's not coming out of the woodwork. So I think it's it's going to hold values. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have a net worth goal, Adam? I don't have a net worth goal. My goal is that when my kids go off to college, that I can do whatever I want, <laughs> that I can put them through college and not have to slave away and work for someone else or, you know, be a slave even to my clients. I mean, I sometimes feel like I'm a slave to my clients today. You know, they they call, they email, and I must get back to them. And at some point, I I don't want to have to. I will either have a team to do that or I will have moved on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me wrap up here with some rapid fire questions and then we'll get into some last words of advice. But 
first, real quick on your allocation, you have almost two hundred thousand dollars in edu- what is it? Do you have ESAs, education saving accounts? Uh, yep, I have education savings accounts and five two nines. And five twenty nines. Okay. What what's your plan with that? I think you're probably Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, one of the high in education accounts at almost yeah, two hundred thousand. For sure. Interesting. Okay. Um the plan is and I wrote a newsletter article years ago about a legacy. And even if my kids don't use the five two nine, they can pass it to their spouse or their kids. And so if I start the balance growing now and they don't need it or they don't use it, it just continues to grow for the family and it's like a legacy. And it's a it's a well intentioned use for education only, you know, reap the rewards of the tax free growth idea. And so if you can continue to pass it down from generation to generation, hopefully nobody will have to worry about saving for college. What are the rules if you let's say you have a couple of kids and you can't spend it all, what are you able to then what else qualifies? Um, it has to be for qualified education of immediate family. So I think cousins count. Um, so it can be your brother, sister, father, mother, daughter, son, grandson, granddaughter. And so, I mean, ideally, we're not going to touch that except for our family's education. So maybe my daughter marries someone who is from another country and they come to the U.S. and they want to go to college. Well, great. You know, we'll probably have some money to help them. Yeah. So that, that's my thought. Is it's it's a family legacy that I can feel pretty good about. Yeah, yeah, good for you. And then HSA, you have about thirty thousand. Yeah, those are becoming I, more popular, but probably not as popular as they should be, right? I think I was just talking on a walk with my wife yesterday that HSAs were a really good idea twenty years ago when they came out with them, and they just didn't get traction for whatever reason. And unfortunately, there is not an HSA qualified plan that I can have in Arizona, the county I live. And so we are no longer allowed to contribute to it. We do spend out of it. But I know the fire community's idea is that you spend on medical expenses out of cash flow and you save the receipts. Because then at whatever point in the future, you can pull that money from the HSA tax-free and you've got a receipt to back it up, even if it was for 10 years ago that said, right. nope, I took that money out and it was to cover that expense. And um, so it's a it's a really flexible tool for tax-free growth. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tease, it's the only money the government will never touch. And my brother-in-law, of course, <laughs> says, what, what if I pan for gold? And I said, yeah, they're going to want a piece of it. You're supposed to report it. <laughs> of course. Of course, yeah. <laughs> So, Adam, you're at 4.3 million, over 4 million here. Does that surprise you? Did you think you'd get there? I remember when I was in high school, my goal was to be a millionaire by the time I was 40. And a couple of years ago, I got together with my old boss from when I was in high school and they were retiring. And um, she said, well, did you make it? (laughs) And I said, did I make what? She goes, did you make it to a million by 40? And I said, ah, I did. In fact, I did. And the reality was, is we were at 2 million when I hit 40, but I figured one was for me and one was for my wife. <laughs> and how, how old were you when you hit your first million? Um, let me see. I just had that up here. My first million, I it was back in 2012. So let's see, 35, 35 for, for my first million. And then your second came how many years later? Five years later. And then what about the third and fourth? I hit three million in two years. So two years for the third million and two years for the fourth million. Yeah. So I I look, I have 700,000 in net worth. Um, Pretty incredible. I mean, the market's been, the market's been very friendly, both real estate and stock. Oh yeah. The last 12 years or so. Yeah. I mean, pretty amazing though. 250,000 to 4.3 in 10 years. That's some pretty wild growth there. Yeah. It's. It's. A, I mean, we we intended to save one salary at all times, and so with both of us working, we were saving four thousand dollars a month. Um, so it was rapid, rapid savings, rapid growth. Wow, good for you. So, what's your driver now? What drives you to keep going, and what previously did drive you? How did that, you know, psychologically deep down? What, how did how has that changed? I think I'm really competitive by nature. And so I always feel like I'm out to prove something and win. And so this is like a game with myself that I can win. I'm not beating anybody. I'm just winning a game that I'm, it's like solitaire. 
You know, I want to see that net worth grow and I want to make the decisions that help it. And a big part of that's tax planning. A big part of that is, you know, forcing systematic savings, things like that. And so it's really hard to change that mindset. I have clients that are in their 70s that continue to accumulate and I keep telling them, I'm going to spend this. Are you ever going to spend this? And they just can't change their mindset. They have pensions coming in and social security coming in and rents coming in and they just can't spend it all. So they keep saving. <laughs> um, I'm will afraid you be I'm able be to? That person. <laughs> you will, you <laughs> think a, so? I don't know. I'm a little worried for myself because I see these people and I think I might be like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at some point, enough is enough at some point. Yeah. And I yeah. don't know what that number is. There, there's so also some fear. I mean, you you talked about it. Assets are richly valued. And so there's fear that this four million turns into two million. Yeah. You know, I work really hard and poof, half of it can yeah, go you away. Say, How much do I really have? Yeah. So final question here, Adam. We talked a lot. So appreciate the advice and, and everything you've shared, but just in closing, what advice would you give to, to somebody who's starting out or if you'd rather go a different route, what are some mistakes you've made that you advise that you would advise against? Yeah. So in terms of, of rules of thumb, save first, spend last. So typically people will spend and then they'll save what's left. And if, you know, inevitably there's nothing left. Um, so the point is pay yourself first. Uh, in business, it's called profit first. So you set that aside and then you craft your budget out of what's left. Same thing for your, your personal budget. And what I tell young people, 15% should be your target. Um, but obviously the more the better. And a financial plan for somebody under 30 or even under 40 should be saving as best as much as possible. So those are, those are some thoughts and rules of thumb for young people getting started out. The other thing is that one thing I've really learned is that leverage in real estate is super helpful. So when you go to buy a stock and it goes up 10%, you've made 10%. When you go to buy real estate and you put 20% down and it goes up 10%, you've made 50%. <laughs> it's incredible. You know, the, the leverage that real estate provides is huge. Although I'm not one of those bang the drum and real estate, real estate, real estate, but it is very valuable and leverage gives you an advantage there. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Adam. Really appreciate everybody again. That's Adam net worth of 4.3. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for opening up and thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was, it was fun. Thanks Adam. Thanks for listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast with Clark Sheffield and Chase Mantinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website at millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.